And good morning, everyone. It's very good to see all of you here this morning. Um, this passage of scripture that we have read is a part of a series of teachings by Jesus that was spoken and taught to his disciples in the last moments before Jesus went to the cross. Matthew's gospel focuses on the Sermon on the Mount, and, and, and that's where Jesus speaks of righteousness and, and actions of, that depicts being a follower of Christ. John's gospel chooses to focus on the last few intimate teachings of Jesus to his disciples, a very small select group. And it is in this moment, Jesus reveals to them secrets of being his disciples. And it's nothing big, it's nothing spectacular, it's nothing about, oh, you're going to be great. But Jesus starts off by washing their feet and telling them, you want to be my disciples? You got to do the lowest of the lowest. You got to be willing to go that low. You got to be willing to, you got to, be, willing to be a servant. And then he goes on to say that the world will hate you, that you're going to face troubles, but fear not, have hope, I will be with you. And now he speaks to them about the Holy Spirit. I think this is one of the very first moments or instances that Jesus introduces the concept of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. I think for all of us here as contemporary Christians, we are very aware of the Holy Spirit. We are very aware of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but sometimes we may not fully understand, or sometimes we need a little bit of recap what the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives really is all about. And I like how Jesus introduces the concept of the Holy Spirit to them. Beginning from the most basic, He lays the foundation of the condition of the human heart, and then He progresses to what the Holy Spirit does for your life and where the Holy Spirit brings you towards. And that's a very easy, simple understanding which I hope today after today's sermon, you'll be able to take back something with you concerning the work of the Holy Spirit in your own lives. Now, the very first thing is Jesus speaks about the human condition. And there is literally no desire for God. Because look at what Jesus says to his disciples. I am going to him who sent me, but yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Sometimes we find it really hard to understand what Jesus is trying to say here to his disciples. And basically what he's telling the disciples is this, I've spoken to you so many things about what's going to happen to me in the next few hours, in the next few days. But you seemed pretty unconcerned about what's going to happen to me. Rather, if you read backwards, you will notice all the disciples' questions were, why are you going there? You know, where are you? Going? What's going to happen to us? The implications for us, right? So that's all the disciples were concerned about. You see, we've spent these three years following you, Jesus. We, ex we are expecting you to do great things. Maybe even at this Last Supper, they, they were in their minds thinking that Jesus tomorrow is going to wage a very big battle and he's going to come out victorious in this battle, right? That was what the disciples were thinking. And so at this point, Jesus even says to them, you know, you have sorrow, not because of what's going to happen to me, but you are sorrowful because of what might happen to you. So the disciples were basically thinking to themselves, well, if Jesus is really, everything that's going to happen to Jesus is as what he's saying, then Man, we've wasted our three years following Jesus. Have we wasted our careers? Man, we could have been the best fishermen in all of Jerusalem right now, in all of Judea, if we hadn't given up our three years to follow Jesus, all for Jesus to tell us at this point that He's going to die. Nothing big's going to happen to the Roman government. And we are most certainly not going to sit as rulers, as kings, as officials, in Jerusalem. And so the disciples were really so sad for themselves and that's why Jesus says to them, because I said these things to you, your, your heart is filled with sorrow. Now as Jesus says this thing, there's also a spiritual implication which reflects in reality the human heart which lacks understanding of who God is and what God does in life. 
There is a lack of understanding of the will and the purpose of God in the human heart. There is a lack of understanding as to what God wants for our life. And a lot of times, like the disciples, our hearts are about what God can do for me, what God can give to me. And if God can't give me these things, then why follow Him? Why believe in this God? This is really a, a, a reflection that Jesus was bringing to His disciples, but more than that, a reflection that we too can reflect for ourselves. And that's why the important question we must really ask ourselves is, what is the purpose of our lives? If our lives are like the disciples, to only live for ourselves, my own goals, and what God can do to help me achieve my own goals, then unfortunately, we will miss out the bigger part or the bigger importance of why we need to be in a relationship with God and why we need to believe in this God. We also need to ask ourselves, do I desire for God? Or do I desire more for the things that God can possibly give to me and provide for me rather than what God wants to provide for me? The human heart, the human condition. But this is where Jesus builds up. He doesn't just stay on the bad news or on the negative news. He moves on and he then speaks a lot about the Holy Spirit. And this is where Jesus says this to his disciples. When he comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And so Jesus then goes on to say, but worry not, right? You may not understand all things now. You may not understand the purpose of God now. And now your minds may only be filled with what you want and what has not been achieved and what you cannot achieve, right? But Jesus says, worry not because the Holy Spirit is going to come and is going to help you. And I like the word nevertheless that's being used by Jesus. In verse 7, you look at the open, Jesus says, nevertheless. Nevertheless. And this is a very important word that changes the whole mood of the conversation. That changes the, the hopeless situation of the human heart to a very hopeful situation. You might not be able to see it, but don't worry, there is hope for you. That God never gives up on the human in spite of how our heart constantly wants to turn away from God. In spite of how our heart is constantly more inward looking, more self-focused. But don't worry, God never gives up on you. There is a cure for the human condition of the heart. And it is in the form of the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the helper. The helper will do these things for you, convict you of your sin. He will convict you towards righteousness. He will convict you of the judgment of God. Three forms of conviction. The word conviction may sound like a very heavy, very serious word, right? But sometimes we must not look at conviction in that manner. Conviction is that process of making known to us what is right and what is wrong. Conviction is that process of bringing to us the deeper knowledge of God. Conviction is that revelation of the wisdom of God to us. And that is what conviction really means. Conviction can be comforting. It can also be at times very uncomfortable because when the Holy Spirit reveals and convicts us of sin, it is going to be uncomfortable. But at the same time, it is comforting when the Holy Spirit convicts us towards righteousness because the Holy Spirit doesn't just say, be righteous, be holy, figure out your way there. No, the Holy Spirit reveals to us what righteousness is and how you can attain righteousness. And that's why it is comforting. It is also comforting when the Holy Spirit reveals to us the plan of God in the form of judgment. That judgment will not befall those who believe in God. Judgment is reserved for those who oppress the people of God. 
Judgment is a form of comfort for us who have been oppressed and for the disciples in those days who were about to face great oppression, great persecution. Jesus was speaking to them about judgment, not to remind them or to put fear into hearts, but rather to give them this form of hope that fret not, fear not, worry not. One day, evil will be judged. Regardless how great the evil is, evil will be judged. And that's why conviction has both purposes of comforting and yet at the same time to make us uncomfortable. And so then as we look at the Holy Spirit's conviction and apply into our lives, how do we respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction? When the Holy Spirit tells you what is right and what is wrong, do you then listen and obey the Holy Spirit? Do you follow what the Holy Spirit tells you or do you just ignore completely what the Holy Spirit tells you and go on doing what you are not supposed to do? Go on living life the way you want to live. Go on living life outside of the purpose and of the will and the plan of God. And then when we fail or when we fall down, then we go to God and say, God, what happened? Why didn't you guide me? Why didn't you reveal to me what's not right? Why didn't you show me the way? And God says, I send the Holy Spirit to you, but unfortunately, you did not want to listen. And so that's why it's so important. As the Holy Spirit convicts, we listen. Now, this is a question or this is a, a, a topic that sometimes we find it very vague, right? So how does the Holy Spirit convict? In what way? Will He speak to me in a very clear, audible voice? Don't do this, don't do that. Will He push me away from what's wrong? How does the Holy Spirit convict? I get asked this question a lot. And the thing is this, it's very simple. A lot of times, He speaks to us through the voice of our consciousness, our conscience. That's how the Holy Spirit sometimes speaks to us. There are many things that we are about to do or, or, or about to say and we inwardly, our conscience tells us, hold back, stop, don't do. That is the voice of the Holy Spirit. If it's for a positive gain, a, a better cause, it is, if it is for a better situation for yourself morally, then listen to that voice of conscience. And I believe all of us have experienced that point in life where our conscience speaks to us so clearly. Don't do it. And if we obey and follow and surrender to that voice of conscience speaking to us, it saves us from a lot of trouble. So that is the Holy Spirit speaking to us and convicting us through our conscience. I believe we have also experienced some form of comfort at times. We are facing crisis, we are facing uh, challenges in life and then suddenly there's that still small voice and a, a small assurance in your heart, everything will be fine, everything will be okay. That is the Holy Spirit comforting you. You might not see the results happen immediately. You might not see things happen the next day or in the next few months maybe, but then as you keep trusting, there's still small voice that tells you, don't worry, everything will be fine. One day, maybe sometimes months or years pass by, and one day you realize, wow, I got out of many challenges. And you look back and you realize that the Holy Spirit has been there, giving me the comfort all along. That is how the Holy Spirit convicts, speaks to us, and comforts us. Jesus continues to build. So He doesn't just reveal what is wrong, what is right. The Holy Spirit guides. And this is very beautiful, how Jesus builds up the work of the Holy Spirit in the believers' lives. He tells the disciples, He says, I have many things, but not enough time, right? When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth for He will not speak on His own authority but whatever He hears, He will speak and He will declare to you the things that are to come. The Spirit of truth, when He comes, He will guide you into all the truth. This is a very beautiful statement that Jesus gives to His disciples. He will guide you into all truth. There's so many things of the Christian faith that we are learning progressively. 
I, wouldn't, I don't like to say that the Christian faith is just all about rules and regulation, do's and don'ts. That's not what the Christian faith is all about. The Christian faith is really about experiencing the grace and the mercy of God for yourself and then living a life that's being transformed by the Holy Spirit daily. If someone comes into the Christian faith and asks, what are the things that I can do and I cannot do now that I'm a Christian? Unfortunately, there really isn't a list of things that you can and you can't do. But the Christian faith, the beauty of the Christian faith is that as you enter and take that step of faith and believe in God, God progressively transforms you. I speak to a group of youths occasionally in schools and, and I talk to them about this thing called transformation. It's a very big word. So I like to use this analogy. Well, guys, you love to fight, right? I grew up in a boys' school, you know. Everyday fighting is like a sport, you know. And our teacher even encourages us on that. Eh? You want to fight? All right, come. You fight now, all right? Settle everything here. Boy school, that's how we were raised up, right? And usually when the teacher puts you together, you, oh, no, let's not fight. Let's just shake hands and, you know, let's be best friends after that, right? And so I, always, I, tell, I tell the students, right? What's transformation really like in reality? Well, if you punch five people a day, tomorrow punch four people. One person lesser. The next day, punch one person lesser, three persons. Well, you're still punching people, but it's just three persons, two persons lesser. As you keep reducing and you keep surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit, the lesser people you punch, one day you realize you stop punching people altogether. Now take this same application and apply it into different aspects of life. You steal five sweets, steal one sweet lesser tomorrow. Lesser and lesser and lesser. One day you stop stealing entirely. Temptation. There's so many temptations that we face and, and we, we give in to temptation. Well, make a stand to give up one temptation a day. And one day you realize I'm no longer tempted by sin. And all these things is how the Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit will tell you progressively, stop this. Cut down on this. Stop that. Do this, do that. And progressively, if you listen and allow the Holy Spirit to take your hand and walk with you and lead you, one day you realize, wow, my life has transformed. My life has changed. So the Holy Spirit makes transformation of life a possibility, not an impossibility. You see, if I were to put a list of things in front of you and say, this is what you must do, this is what you cannot do as a Christian, figure it out yourself, that would be an impossible mission. That would be a mission where every one of us will come and say, I have failed. Because in the list of things that you sent to me, only one thing I could do. And that's what the Holy Spirit does not do. The Holy Spirit doesn't put a list for you. Rather, He enables you to transformation by leading you and say, hey, come, let's take baby steps into transforming your life. God's not demanding you to be a perfect person because that is humanly impossible. God's demanding you that you submit and surrender and take hold of the Holy Spirit and take that first step, take that next step, keep moving forwards. One day you will get there. One day you will get there. One day you will look back and say, wow, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, I have changed so much. I've made so much changes that I never thought was possible. And this is because the Holy Spirit doesn't just enable you, He empowers you with each step you take. You feel the power of the Holy Spirit giving you that extra energy, that extra motivation, that extra drive to change and to do even better the next day. And with each step forwards you take, the Holy Spirit adds on the power into you. You see, recently I've been into running, right? Because I was kind of embarrassed. The first time I went with Brother Richard to Cambodia, they said they want to do a five-kilometer run. You know, I cannot do it. I can only do a 500-meter run, you know? And I was very embarrassed. And I came back and I said, you know what? I need to work on, on running a little bit so I won't be so embarrassed the next time I go with him, right? 
And that's what I've been doing, right? Get up each day, and I try to do two kilometers, three kilometers, you know. It's hard, but I'm getting there, you know. And recently, I've been looking at some things that can help you run better. And the best thing that, I've saw on the in- that I saw on the internet recently is this thing called carbon running shoes, right? Carbon-plated running shoes. And I watch a few YouTube videos about it, and they say it really helps. It propels you without you even needing to put in that effort. And I was like, this is what I need, right? This is what I need, carbon. You know, I was cycling before this, and you know, we changed everything to carbon. Even, you know, the wheels became carbon. The the bike was carbon, the wheels were carbon, everything was carbon. Carbon handlebars, everything carbon, carbon seat posts. And then I decided, you know what, if that seat post breaks, it's going to be really dangerous. So no carbon for the seat post. Put an aluminium seat post, you know. Carbon gets you faster on a bike. And I was like, carbon for shoes? Wow, I should try that. Then I checked the price out. Wow, it's not humanly possible to buy that shoes, those shoes, right? And if you do buy the shoes, I'll make sure I have to run every day, every hour to, to fulfill the value. But carbon shoes are shoes that really can take you to that next level without actually having to put much effort. Because that was a YouTube video that, that, peop, that this runner, an amateur runner, right? He wore normal shoes, then he wore carbon shoes. And his times were very different. He's not a really good runner. And these were all things that kind of convinced me, well, carbon shoes is probably the way to go, you know? Might get you there faster, right? I like to think of the Holy Spirit in this way. The Holy Spirit empowers you, gives you that power with each step you take. He's that, he's that empowerment that you need, that, that, that strength from God that you need to change from whatever you want to be changed from, from whatever bondage you want to get yourself out from. That is the key, the Holy Spirit's power to give you that extra power to change and to live a life for God. And that's why Jesus says, trust in the Holy Spirit, the helper. He is for you. He's not against you. He is for you to help you to be more and more like God. And so, can we surrender to the Holy Spirit? It's not a bad thing to surrender to the Holy Spirit, but it's a good thing. It's like carbon shoes for your running. It propels you forward into the direction that God wants you to go. It is that power that you need to break free from bondages. It is that power that you need to live a holy and righteous life. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, guide you, enable and empower you. And the last thing that Jesus says is the Holy Spirit glorifies. Who does He glorify? Jesus says the Holy Spirit will glorify me referring to Jesus. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I say that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit, in short, the helper, God sends for us, speaks about God, glorifies God. In short, the Holy Spirit advocates for God, not for himself. That is the Holy Spirit. And so what Jesus is also really telling uh, His disciples is that when the Holy Spirit is given to you, He's revealing to you God. He's revealing to you, making known to you the wisdom of God. The Holy Spirit leads you to a better and deeper understanding of God. The Holy Spirit, as Jesus tells the disciples, is not for personal gain. It's not an extra power given to you so that you can do wonderful, brilliant things to bring glory to yourself. Rather, the Holy Spirit is to bring you closer into a relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is not for selfish ambition. And that's why you'd see later on in the book of Acts, there was this magician that was performing a lot of magic tricks in the book of Acts. 
And then this magician goes up to the apostles of Jesus and he sees them performing signs and wonders and asks, can I have some of your power? And I think this really gives us a very clear understanding of what the work of the Holy Spirit and the function of the Holy Spirit truly is in our lives. The Holy Spirit is not for personal gain. The Holy Spirit is not for our own selfish ambition. The Holy Spirit given to us certainly is not so that we can go about performing miracles and, you know, and, and casting out demons in our own authority. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit because the function of the Holy Spirit, as we can read from the Bible, is really to draw us closer to God, to make us better as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and it is to make known to us the greater and deeper wisdom of God. That is really the function of the Holy Spirit in us. So do we now understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Especially the last point. I think this is a point that Jesus stressed to his disciples because he understands the human heart. He understands the human heart that tends to want things from God for myself. What can benefit me? What can make me better? What can put me above other people? And this is where we must understand and must be really careful and that's why I'm always very careful when I say the Holy Spirit speaks to me. You know, I'm very careful with that. We must not misuse this phrase, God spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. The Holy Spirit revealed to me something about you, something about that. And if it's about personal gain, personal ambition, and this is something Paul also reminds the Christians, if it is for personal gain, then unfortunately that might not be for the Holy Spirit. And Paul was reminding and warning the Christians that we do not simply throw out and use the name of God in vain because God gives the Holy Spirit to us for a very specific purpose, to draw us closer to God. And so do we understand the purpose and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? I pray that today, through this sermon, we get a very good step-by-step -step understanding of the Holy Spirit. And to end things, I want to inform all of you, the Holy Spirit is in all of us. It's with all of us and it's for all of us. There is no special dispensation needed. Oh, I want the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is with you even before you believe in Christ, moving you towards the saving grace of God. And as you become a Christian, believe in God, the Holy Spirit continues to lead and guide you. No special dispensation needed. Surrender to the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in your lives. Let us pray.